Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Seeking Voices of Healing, Health, and Hope. I had the pleasure of interviewing a fabulous woman uh, today named Juliana Hever. Juliana Hever is a um, known by the eponym, the plant-based dietitian, and her website is plantbaseddietitian.com. She's so cool and has done such neat things. I'm always fascinated by people's story. And she tells a lovely story of how she was initially a theater major and how she used that theater major and how that evolved into becoming fascinated and interested in nutrition. She's the author of so many books, The Choose You Now Diet. I love that title, The Choose You Now Diet. Um, She's helped out with um, writing articles in Veg News. She, uh, one of the other books she wrote that I think is super cool is called The Vegetarian Diet. Um, She's given TEDx talks. She authored The Complete Eating's Guide to Plant-Based Nutrition, which I think is so cool. So just really neat stuff. I think you'll be really excited to listen to her. What I like about Juliana is that she uh, talks about nutrition very openly, very candidly, talks about her struggles with her own weight and how that brought her towards nutrition and also accepts people for where they are. And I think that that's super important. I hope you enjoy listening to her conversation and our conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. So I'm so excited to see you, Juliana. It's really nice to just have you on the show. And I can't, we were just reflecting beforehand that you and I have actually never met, which is so crazy because we know all the same people and we go to the same conferences, but here we are just meeting for the first time on Zoom. So I'm I'm really glad to meet you here today and to have you on my, my podcast. Likewise, Monica, I'm so excited to finally connect with you. Yes, it's so great. So, you know, I always like, so as I mentioned to you before, when we, before we started, I started this podcast sort of to bring people some, you know, to sort of debunk a lot of misinformation that's happening in nutrition and lifestyle and heart disease. And people don't really know sort of what to eat and how to sort of go about their day and like, oh, should I eat this? Should I eat that? And the other thing I wanted to do with this podcast is bring people sort of hope and to remind people that, that it's not about um, life doesn't isn't perfect. And so your choices are not almost perfect, but, you know, we're just trying to get better every day. And so um, these are the kind of the goals of this. And I thought you'd be a great person to have on this um, show to talk about it. And one of the things that I just thought we'd start with, because I think it's always fun to find out about how people started. Like I was reading about you and you're a theater major, you know, you, you started off a very different person. And how did you end up in this space? And, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. I know it's so funny. I love that saying that Steve Jobs, that quote, how he says, you can't look forward. You can't know what's going to happen. You have to, I don't, I'm totally butchering it. You have to look backwards to, to connect the dots. And I would have, my evolution or whatever, this journey has been so interesting, but it all came together. So yeah, I grew up in Los Angeles and my mom says that I danced before I walked. And so I was in dance school, I was always dancing. And when I was about 11 years old, my dance teacher said in front of all of my ballerina peers, you know, Juliana, cut out your snacks. And that was like a pivotal moment for me. Cause I was like, what, what does that mean? You know, cause I was developing, I was going, turning into a woman and it, floored me. Like I was embarrassed, but I was curious and it just made me start to think about things at 11 years old. So I started reading, reading everything I can get my hands on, on diet. Yeah. I just want to know, you know, and this is before the internet. So obviously, and, um, I just kept reading and I think I was about 16 when one of the books that came into my hands was John Robbins diet for a new America. And another pivotal moment, because I was shocked at how food ended up on the plate and that interconnectivity between the environment and animals and food. I just, I had no idea and it changed my life. And I wanted to not contribute to that world. And so I decided I'm not going to eat animals anymore. And this lasted not a long time because I wasn't cooking. I, you know, there wasn't any information out there on how to do it. I didn't know any vegetarians. My mother was like freaked out. What are you going to do? You know, I was trying to eat her side dishes or stuff like granola bars. I didn't know what to do. And so I always call this my intervention where my parents enlisted their friend, our friend, Kendra, family friend, who was a nurse. And we all went out to the steakhouse and I will never forget this. We ordered a teriyaki steak with a pineapple ring right on top. And I always say like, once you know, you can't unknow. 
And I'm looking at the steak and I remember that first bite very well, but she proceeded to tell me how I'm going to be deficient in protein and iron and B12, the stuff we still hear to this day. And I, of course, got scared. I was a little, I was a teenager. So So she was telling you, you were going to be deficient in all these things. If you went vegetarian, if I stayed vegetarian, that if I didn't eat the steak and I go back to being normal, quote unquote, normal, I'd have all of these health, you know, problems. So I did, I went back and But I kept thinking like vegetarians are not dying. Like it's not like this thing where it's like you have heart disease and vegetarianism, you know, this deficiency in iron or whatever. And so I still was curious, but anyway, I went back to the usual, back to my regularly scheduled program and, but I kept reading and I kept wanting to know more. And then fast forward to, I was an actress. And then my manager told me the same thing. You have to lose a few pounds for the camera. So I was like, okay, back to this. So she threw me into a trainer with, with a trainer to get me ready for camera. And I fell in love with personal training. And that was like, oh my gosh, I love this. Cause I've always, I used to, when I was five years old, we have actual cassette recordings of me training my sister and our best friends that we grew up with. Like I would do like exercise classes. And in high school, my high school gym teacher, she would throw me to, to teach the class while she would go out. And I just loved it. So that was like a new passion. So I was, I was going to be a trainer and then I was going to be pre-med. And then (laughs) I decided, you know, I was going to, training would be perfect while I was, um, you know, what's it called? While I was acting. So I can go out on auditions and everything, but I had to go to college. This was all unfolding during college. And I went from pre-med to acting in college. So I did a lot of my pre-med the first couple of years. And then as soon as I graduated, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be an actress. I'm going to train. I finished with a theater degree. And then I started training and everyone was asking me like what they should eat. And, you know, when you become a personal trainer, you get like a two week training course, you get a big handbook and you have to memorize one chapter on nutrition. And I just didn't feel confident or competent to answer those questions, you know, accurately. So that was was only a two week class. Yeah. As a personal personal training training class is two weeks. Yeah. Even if you don't even have to do that, I did that in preparation to take the exam. All you have to do is pass an exam, which is why it's horrifying that every time I'm at the gym and I hear the trainers giving all this advice that I've overheard is so harmful and people take it, they really listen to it and they trust it. So it's a little scary seeing what it really looks like. So Just to clarify, just to hear again. So for a personal training, there's a, you don't, you just have to take the test, but you don't have to do the two week class. And there's only one hour of nutrition education in there. Well, granted, this was 25 years ago, so I don't know how it is now. Good point. Good point. Mm-hmm. But maybe there was a two-week program I had. To, this is a long time ago. Um, and I know that I took a two-week course and I sat for the exam and boom, I was a personal trainer. So maybe there was, maybe you did have to. And you had to do CPR certified and all that, but that doesn't help you about nutrition anyway. But personal trainers are considered advocates and experts in nutrition. So I find that kind of, kind of scary. So I did, I signed up for grad school and all of a sudden I loved school more than ever in my life, straight A's, loved it, like passionate. It was exciting and I was personal training. I quit acting because I got married and um, it just wasn't conducive to my lifestyle. So I was a personal trainer and fell in love with it while I was studying nutrition. And seven years later, because I had a kid, all this stuff unfolded during those seven years, I became a dietitian. Once I finished grad school, oh, even during grad school, I started noticing things like that the Dairy Council sponsored a lot of our information. Or I went to my first Amer- academy, it was American Dietetics Association back then. I went to the first meeting there and went to the expo and couldn't believe the big, hugest booths where the dairy industry and McDonald's and Burger King. And, you know, there's like, you know, all these industry related things and all the talks were industry emphasized. So I learned a lot during grad school, but then I started kind of poking around after I finished and started reading. And then when I had my two kids and I was sitting at home, cause you know, you just sit around doing nothing when you have kids. I, and transit, I was transitioning from trainer to dietitian. I started delving into the literature again with the, you know, academic, you know, background now and the statistics, the, the ability to analyze statistics and really look at research and find out that you can get protein from plants and you can get iron better sourced from plants. And then that's when I met Dr. T. Colin Campbell. And I started, I decided I wanted to make a movie. It just like all unfolded. And I was like, I went plant-based, changed everything about my health. And then I became a dietitian. I was like working with clients. And then I was like, okay. So I went out there and I was like, wow. And then everything came together and then everything fell together. I was like, what a waste of a degree to become an actress. But now I'm on stage and now I'm, I, you know, I'm always constantly in front of audiences. So it really actually helped me. And it all, like Steve Jobs says, it all kind of just comes together. And uh, it makes sense why my journey was so interesting. 
Well, I, I think that, you know, so congratulations and props to you. And I, I don't think, um, you know, certainly when I look back at my life as well, the, the road is never straight. And, you know, you, you almost have to go through so many times, you have to go through so many different steps and hurdles and, and curves and whatever is to then figure out sort of where you want to be. And I don't feel like, you know, I don't, I don't think you wasted your theater degree as much as it helped you evolve into the person that you are. And I think that that's really neat. And, um, and then you came out with it. You say so now you're, you're a registered dietitian, isn't it? Yes, I got my master's in nutrition. I'm a registered dietitian. And just on your point, my daughter is like going off to college right now. And it's so weird to go back to that point because she's like, mommy, what if I don't, what if I pick the wrong school? What if, what if, what, what if? And I keep saying, look, you really have no idea. Just go with what feels right in that moment and it will lead you to wherever you're going to end up. But it's, it's like, if you could tell your younger self, yeah. just let it go. It's just, it's so interesting to see it from my daughter's perspective now. Yeah, I bet that's true. You know, so fun fact is, you know, as you know, I'm a, I'm a preventive cardiologist, but I, um, when I started at the University of Virginia um, and I was a religion major. Um, and so I, I always believed that I was gonna end up like living in India and meditating or something. I'm not sure what I thought I was gonna do, but, and then I was gonna come back and teach religious studies. And so, you know, I think that would have been a fabulous life too, but you know, you're not always, you know, sometimes where you start is most of the time I, and I tell my kids too, we have kids similar ages and I always tell them where you start is not where you're going to end. And, um, you know, you just pick a decision based on who you are at that moment. And then it's going to change. I thought I was going to be an economist. I thought I was going to, uh, do this and that. And here I am, uh, in a totally different field than I, than I thought. So, uh, go figure. So I, I love your story. So thank you for sharing that. And so, you know, I, and I like that it brought you full circle, right? Like you always had sort of a desire to be um, whatever vegetarian, maybe for ethical reasons, you know, something as a child, but you were sort of confused on how to do it. And you had all these people in your life that were saying, well, like, you're, you know, you're going to be in a big trouble. And it's like your parents staged an intervention to get you to eat meat uh, to make sure that you stayed healthy, you know? And so, you know, it takes time to sort of undo that and kind of figure out who you, who, you know, come back to where you were and then do the research to make you realize that um, you can be healthy as a vegetarian. So let's go through that a little bit. So I can be healthy as a vegetarian, say what, like, how do you, how do you reconcile that when people say that to you that, well, shouldn't I eat a little bit of meat for my protein? Or what do you say to your patients? You know, what are like three or four things you would say to patients when they come to you as a client and they say, I want to lose weight, but I'm worried about my protein. I'm tired all the time. Like, what, what are some of the things you say to patients? Right. Well, I was really excited to have the opportunity to write my first book because it was like what I needed at that time. Like it's, it was a complete idiot's guide to plant-based nutrition. And I wish I'd had that manual. Like if someone had said, you're going to be deficient in that, I would have gone to the book and said, nope, here's where you get all that. So what I tell people coming to me now, I love that we have social media, even though it's a good and bad thing, a double-edged sword. We have information, but we have so much misinformation out there too. Right. And you have to sift through it. There's almost like too much information for a lot of people. But what I tell people is that there is no such thing as a perfect diet. You know, if you look at the standard diet that most people are on getting protein or, or chasing protein, I always say there's this persistent pursuit of protein. It's become this like, wow, especially now with like the social media where everyone's like pushing more and more and more. And it's like ridiculous. It's gotten to this ridiculous point, but it won't go away. It's this myth that will not go away. But there is no such thing as a perfect diet. So anyone on that diet, maybe they're getting too much protein. They're definitely getting too much saturated fat and sugar and all this stuff because they're pursuing protein or they're on the standard diet, but there's just no perfect diet. I don't even think anyone could actually get hundred percent DRI every single day. And do we need to, these are Maybe all basic. Cl clarify everything. for everybody what you mean by DRI. Sorry. Yeah. The Institute of Medicine recommendations for your daily intake of vitamins, minerals, and macronutrients. So the R is for recommended. So daily recommended intake. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Um, but it's, you know, do we really need to get hundred percent? Is that really true? And look at all of the research on less, maybe more on time restricted feeding and fasting in general, like not that you have to fat, that's not, you don't have to be fasting or time restricted eating to be on a plant-based diet by any means, but meaning that maybe less is more, you know, we are chronically overnourished. Chronic overnourishment has taken over the world over malnutrition. There are more people overnourished. 
And I think that if we can let go of that pressure to get enough, then maybe we can go back to what do we really need? What's essential? And that's what I try to do and make simple in my books and my talks, everything is like, it's okay. You're not going to be, you know, running off to the protein deficiency wing of the hospital by, you know, by eating a plant-based diet, you can get enough. You just have to be mindful. But I think in any way of eating, you need to be mindful. Like any person that's trying to eat healthy needs to plan a little bit and think about it. And so many people will tell me, no, that's, you need, you're going to be deficient in protein or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll look at their food journal and they're like eating. I mean, I had this woman on the plane complain about there's too much sugar in Prosecco over champagne. And she complained about it. And then she proceeded to eat the cookies that they served her. <laughs> like, what, what is, where are our priorities? Yes. Yeah, so you said some really good things that I want to tease out before you keep going, because you're saying such great things. So you first, you said something that you, where people are chronically overnourished. Uh, and I really like that term that we're, we're always trying to sort of increase our intake to make ourselves healthier um, in sort of the concept that maybe we're actually eating too much. Uh, and there's a lot of data out there now that actually people who are just because you're eating more food, you can still be malnourished, right? So that you can um, be eating more food and have an excess amount of weight and adiposity or fat, um, but you're actually malnourished um, because you're not getting sort of the right foods. And then the second thing that you said, which I think is important is that, is to remember that uh, that the guidelines and a lot of these RDIs and recommended daily amounts that we should be eating have very sort of imperfect science behind them and sort of understanding what the right amount of calcium, for instance, which is a big uh, hot button item is how much is the right amount of calcium. And so we don't really fully understand that. And so are we giving people too much or are we recommending too much or too little and how should those things be absorbed? And so it just makes us remember that that some, that a lot of the science that is backing some of these guidelines is not, is imperfect. Uh, and that, you know, looking back and step or looking in and saying, okay, what do we really know is really important. So I, I really like those comments. Just to expound a little bit on that, because I think it's really important. You know, I made a plant-based plate when I was writing my book and then a plant, I mean, at first it was a pyramid. And then as soon as we published the book, it was on the cover, they switched to a plate. So I had to switch to a plate. And then I use it sometimes but you have to think about it. Like we're creating this for the average human. And for instance, I, as a five foot four female, do not need the same amounts of portions as my six foot um, football playing lineman's son. Like we need different quantities and different foods. And if we're putting a plate together for the general public, there's a lot of wiggle room in there. And you can't, yeah. you're saying this is average, but what do you need? And so there is definitely some inter-individual variation there, but also generally speaking, if you're eating healthy foods and you're focusing on prioritizing the foods that are going to be nutritionally dense, you know, and ideal for just health, then you really can't go wrong if you listen to hunger and satiety. And you, if you're at a healthy weight, great. If you want to lose weight, you need to eat less. If you want to gain weight, you need to eat slightly more. If you can get that simple, and that's what I do with my clients, it is so much more simple than we think it is. It's not about, I'm the weirdest dietitian because I will not measure, weigh, calculate, or count. I don't, I don't want anyone counting. I want people to tune in. I use mindfulness now. I'm kind of like an anti-dietitian dietitian because all that stuff is great as a baseline, as some knowledge, but what really works in real life and what will get you the results and the lab work and the healthy weight that you want. And it's a little bit much more simple than it seems to be. Yeah, no, I love that. And I agree with all of what you're saying. And I certainly have do, have not ever counted calories. Maybe uh, maybe when I was 15 years old and I was trying to lose weight, I tried to count some calories. And But I, I also advocate less counting and more focus on sort of what your body wants. But how do you reconcile with people who struggle with that concept in itself, which is that I just, my body doesn't tell me when to stop eating. Like I find, and you know, the people, there are people that say that I could eat and eat and eat because I just like the idea of eating or like to consume. How do you reconcile that comment you made previously with that, um, with what a patient might say? Okay. Well, I'm that person too. I, I can't, I can't shut it down. Like I love to eat. Um, I can't, I don't have an off switch, you know? And I, so I relate to a lot of people like that. 
there's strategies that go into place. And most people don't even know when they're hungry because let's start there. Let's start with when you're hungry. Most people don't even know because we're told exogenous, you know, things like eat first thing in the morning, or you need to eat six times a day, or we're told these like structures that are honestly started with things like like Kellogg's told us that we have to have breakfast. That's the most important meal of the day. But breakfast technically is when you break your fast. Doesn't matter what time of day it is. So I think I've combined the data with time-restricted eating to help with this exact thing. So first of all, finding true hunger. And there's ways to find what is true hunger, you know, and there's ways to mitigate hunger. Like if you are on a schedule and you can align with your circadian clock, then you will be hungry the same. If you eat the same time every day, you'll be hungry that time every day. But I had to learn what hunger really felt like. But satiety is a whole other animal because once you're eating, it's more of a behavioral thing. It's the stopping it. Then there's all, oh my God, this is such a complex issue, Monica. I could talk about this all day because there's that whole, there's this whole line of thinking out there of people saying, if you cut out fat, you could eat as much as you want, which to me causes what I term um, fat phobia. It makes people afraid of fat, but fat is essential in our diet. We need some fat in our diet and it perpetuates binging. So it says, oh, I, if I hack the system, I could eat it as much as I want. And that's not healthy either. So I use more behavior. I use a lot of cognitive behavior. I didn't know what I was doing. I, basically, I've been doing this for 18 years and I've learned from my one-on-one -on -one clients, like these, I have these very deep, intimate conversations with my clients and we get into all the emotional and the psychosocial reasons and ways we eat that really do get in the way of what you're talking about here. And if you navigate it in a real strategic way, you can handle it. You know, you learn how to eat when you're hungry. You learn to stop. I eat once or twice a day because then it's less, fewer times I have to stop. So I've, I've realized that these are cognitive behavioral approaches to this. And it comes, to, there's all these different things that come together, like the, the chemistry, the biochemistry, the psychosocial, the environmental, so many things that come into play. And that's what I kind of help tease apart with my clients, but it is really complicated. That part. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I think- that's why sort of one-on-one -on -one counseling and one is, is really the key to so many people's success, I find, because as I've, you know, written books now, and, and I think that I've given people a manual on sort of like general ideas of what to do, um, then people definitely come to you and say, but what do I actually do? And I've learned that I've learned that they're right, uh, is that the one size fits all doesn't work for every, it doesn't work for everybody. And everybody comes to the table with different things and different baggage and different emotional issues um, and phobias and fears and joys. And, and um, we have to sort of take all that into account, which is why sort of one-on-one -on -one counseling and one-on-one -on -one, um, focus on that person's diet is really important and sort of finding where out where people are. And, and I think that that's the key is that it, it it's hard, you know, it's hard for people to change and it's hard for people um, to kind of figure out what to do. And, and so that's why I'm so happy that you're doing what you're doing uh, and supporting clients in the way that you do. Thank you. I think that there's two really important messages that I'd like to, I always want to emphasize. First is that you're not broken. These people really, people, not these people, a lot of us think we're broken. Well, why do I have to blah, blah, blah. Like there's like, everyone feels like they're broken. And then there's a lot of healthcare practitioners or people telling them they are, you know, oh, it's your hormones. It's your this, it's your that, but really it's the food. And it's, and then the second message is that we are living in this society where it is normal to eat junk food. It is normal to eat 24 seven. It is thrown in our face everywhere, commercials and social media feeds and everywhere you go, there's this message of eat more and eat more junk food and eat these hyper palatable foods that of course we can't eat just one. It's impossible to eat just one ch chip. Like we cannot do that, but it's not you. It's that we're, these foods are designed for us to want to eat more of them. And it lights up our brain and we are human and humans act a certain way because of our biochemistry. But then if you've got this biochemistry happening and everyone around you is saying, oh, come on, just have one with me. Come on. And everyone wants to, and we're tribal and we want to connect with our loved ones and our friends. And you're the odd person out to say no. It's really hard. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's really, really hard. And it's hard to navigate that. And it's hard to stand in your ground. I mean, even me, most of my friends and family around me, my local, the people I see most times, they don't eat like me. I'm the weird one. I'm the, odd, even 20 something years later, I'm the odd one. They know that I do it. They still pressure me. 
And it's still uncomfortable, even, even knowing what I know and knowing I'm not going to be deficient and knowing I don't need to eat that. It's still a lot of pressure. And I and imagine not knowing, not having that confidence. It's a really tough world to navigate. Yeah. I, I, good. Such good points. And what was your second point? That was, those were two. One is that okay. you're not broken. It's not you. It's the food. And the second thing is that we're living in the society that yes. normalizes eating unhealthy foods all the time. Yeah, You know, it, it's interesting because I think about, um, you know, how everybody wants to meet for dinner or, um, you know, all of our socializing is over a meal. Um, and I find that it's actually very cumbersome. And as I've gotten older, maybe more confident as you've put it, or because I just don't want to eat junk. Um, I don't want to eat meat over a meal. I want to meet over a cup of tea or I want to meet for a walk. And so some of the things I try to teach people to do is to change that dynamic around food. Like you can eat your food, the foods that you know are healthy and good for you. And that, you know, we want you to eat. And then meet those people for that socializing and sort of tribal community as let's go for a walk together. Let's go sit together. Let's play a game together. Let's, you know, there's so many other ways to connect with people besides over food um, because there's such an emphasis on food. And I, I agree with you, you know, I, I raised plant-based children, um, but as they hit their adolescence, um, you know, it's fascinating the things that they've come home with. And my 11 and 12 year old, they, you know, they, they have all these conversations with me and these ones you'll, you'll enjoy as one who has children as well. And so she'll, you know, the 12 year old was like, mom, I had this thing. It's called Lay's potato chips. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I mean, you just can't help but laugh. And you're like, oh, how did you think of them? And so they were like, you know what? I was so excited to have it and they were terrible. And I was like, yes, you know, so, but, but they haven't felt that way about all the things and they'll, they've come home now and they've tried Cheetos and they've, and they're things that are these very addictive junk foods that their friends are showing them and they're eating them. And, and you know what? I say nothing um, because I raise my children to eat a certain way. And if they're going to try different things or eat junk food once in a while because their friends eat them, I'm okay with that because I feel like as long as I am teaching them sort of overall healthy food, uh, then they're going to eventually come back. And I, I certainly don't want rebellion in, in, in the future because they said that I was too strict with them. But it, it, what it is interesting is, is that as I, they walk around when they make their lunch in the morning, it's really cute. I, I should take a video of them as they walk around the house. Cause they'll say like, well, let's see, I have a vegetable. And so if they take their baby spinach and they put it in the thing, they're like, okay, I've got free fruit. I've got a seaweed. Okay. So what's going to be my main meal. And it's, it's really cute because as they, as they're getting older, they're conscious of, oh, I need my veggies and I need my fruit. And that's sort of how we want our kids to grow, right. Is to sort of have those fundamentals in place. I'm sure you do similar things with your kids, especially oh. that lineman football kid you have. No, kudos to you. I did not have that same thing. I, that was my dream. And it's part of why I was divorced, to be honest, like it was not on the same page in my household. And tragically when I, when that happened, like now my son comes home and he's taken his advice from the coach football, you know, protein mommy, I need, and he's eating the worst diet I've ever seen. And it kills me. It kills me. They know what I do. They know who I am. They grew up around it. When I was there, I was, you know, we were together. I was creating all star. I was doing what that was my fantasy was doing what you're doing. And I love that. And it's beautiful. And I do that. I do that with my clients. I help my clients navigate that, but it have to, you know, like you said, you, you can't, like I, when I had so much resistance with my kids about it, then they just wouldn't want to hang out. They wouldn't want to be around. They, that it tore the, us apart. And I had to let go and say, you know what? And my daughter came back. She's like all about it now. And she's eating, she's been a vegetarian her whole life and she's eating healthier and she's definitely got it. She's older, but my son is in the thick of high school football and like I can't compete with the coach. So it's, here's what, this is the other, this is my third message for everyone out there. No matter what, no matter how much knowledge or accessibility to information or healthy food environment, you have to want it. And I relay this. I always go back to my dad who just, he had a stroke. It was two years ago. He eats horrible. He, he laughs at me saying that diet matters. And his doctor said, eat whatever you want. Just don't have coffee or alcohol. His cardiologist said this. And then he looked at me and I said, dad, you know, I could help you. 
And he looked at me in the eyes and he said, Jewel, you have to want it. Hmm. He didn't want it. And he's, he was back in the hospital. I mean, it's like you just, and I realized that. And that was my first few years out there. I'm like, oh my gosh, I was screaming from the mountaintops. If you eat a plant-based diet, you have to do this. And here's this study and here's that. And this is my before and after with this client. And I was banging my head against the wall. And it took me a long time. It was a really humbling experience to go, wait a second. I'm not as effective as I want to be. I want to change everyone. I want to help the world. I wanted that so bad. And I finally realized I only could help the people that want to be helped, you know? And when I finally let that go, when I started choosing my clients, not just taking anyone that would, because I get inquiries all the time to work with me. And, you know, I, I say no to most people because they have to want it because otherwise we're not going to have success. And I don't want that. I want to be helpful and use my time effectively. So I had to let go. And the hardest one was my dad, but my children, my babies, my loves of my life. Yeah. But I, I think you're okay still. I mean, Juliana, because I, I do think that, um, kids listen and they hear a lot and, um, I think that they go through their course, but just like your daughter, your son will come back around. Like when I, when my kids, I've always sort of, you know, I, my husband's on board. So I, I was lucky. Uh, and he is plant-based as well. And so we've only, my kids have only eaten those foods, but when they went out, they would try different things. And what I have found is, is that I literally say nothing. And to, when they were little, they'd eat chicken fingers and things like that. And, and then they'd tell me, look, I hate chicken fingers and looking for like validation that it was good or bad. This is when they were eight or nine years old. And I would say, okay, well, how, how did you think of them? And um, then they would tell me, oh, they were really good or they were really bad or whatever they thought about it. And I wouldn't say anything, but still ate, fed them the same way at home. Like we, I'm Indian. We had a lot of lentils and da um, dals and rice. And I just, that's how I cook. And so what, what's happened over time, again, with always doing everything exactly the same is my kids tell everyone that they are plant-based, that they are vegetarian. Some will say they're most, my son says he's vegan. Uh, he's a tennis player and plays tennis three, four hours a day and still um, is completely plant-based. And so the point of the story is not to show like, oh, my kids are great as much as to say, I think they all evolve and they all evolve at their different space and speed and they'll come around. And as long as, you know, they're hearing you and they're hearing your words and when, as you pointed out, when they're ready, they will come to it. And, you know, I, I think that your lesson about patient care is also important. And I often tell people you have to meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. And so sometimes it's, uh, you know, and that it doesn't have to be perfection. It just has to be a little bit more. Right. That thank you for saying that. Thank you so much. And that goes right back to what we were saying about not knowing how the journey is going to unfold. But to your point, when my daughter was born, I was so excited. You know, I literally her first word was mom and her second word. I'm not kidding. Antioxidant. <laughs> <laughs> I was feeding her every day. I was just like, anti, you were eating your anthocyanins. I was trying to teach her about nutrition. It was like so important to me. And I was like, if I just like implant it and like, you know, just want to like infuse them. But again, they have to have their own journey. So yeah, thank you for saying that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about your book. Um, I really like the title, the Choose You Now podcast you have and the Choose You Now book. And, and so maybe you can um, tell me a little bit about that title, what you mean by that, and, it, um, and tell me about the book and the podcast. Thank you. Actually, we have a pause on the, I called it the pause cast, but the Choose You Now podcast is on pause, but we had, I think 90 episodes or something like that, that are still out there that I loved. I loved, but it was based on, actually, no, that was the basis of the name of the book. So Choose You Now Diet. Okay. First of all, Choose You Now. Okay. This, this book was a book I always wanted to write. It was like my seventh book or something, but it was the one that I always wanted to write. It was my story. Everything I've learned in 18 years of working intimately with so thousands of people at this point and or at least many hundreds one-on-one -on -one. and choose you now is about all that we just talked about it's that when you get on the airplane and they tell you you have to put on your oxygen mask first and then you could take care of everyone else because in society we're always trying to do everything for everyone especially as women especially as mothers it's like you always put yourself last but you're only going to be your strongest, most effective, 
self and able to help people in the most way or do everything and be effective in your work and your life if you are your healthiest self, your wholest self. So it starts with you. And then the choose you now is this mindfulness component. And of course, the three things that I focus on in this book are, of course, a whole food plant-based diet. And then I incorporate time-restricted eating because this really is, I've been doing mostly lifestyle transformation. You know, I'll do these consults with people that come with a new diagnosis or they want to lose a few pounds, but really the relationship to food has to change. And so it's a transformation program. So this was basically that, but the third piece is mindfulness and that's the now part. And, you know, you teach what you want to learn. This is what I've been focusing on is being here now. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. All you could do is choose right now. And especially when it comes to turning off binging behaviors or learning how to eat foods and saying no to things that you really, really want, tempting foods. And when someone's especially throwing it in your face, you know, don't you want this? Oh, I made this for you. All of those things you get to choose now. And so I have the very first exercise I have with my clients is I want you to sit and I want you to spend some moments and go inside yourself and think, what does it look like to have complete control of your diet, to be at the weight you want, to have the lab results you want, to feel healthy and energetic? What does that mean to you? And it has to be so visceral. And it doesn't matter if it's as super, quote unquote superficial as putting on your bikini or going in your closet and putting anything on to, I want to survive to, you know, take care of my children, or I want to play with my, doesn't matter. There's no right, wrong, good, or bad. What matters to you? It has to be so visceral that when those temptations are in your face, which they will be, no matter how you navigate it, there will always be op opportunities that you choose that why instead of that temptation. And you have to do it again and again and again every day for the rest of your life there's no way around it and so when that that why becomes more powerful and then you start to see it because a lot of people come to me they're eating a horrible diet but when they start to feel it and see it and actually viscerally understand what it means what happens when you eat food as medicine and and start to love your food because i want people to love their food otherwise what's the point it's not sustainable we love our food um, i was my mouth is watering when you were talking about dal and i love indian cuisine so much um, until you, when they feel it, then they start to see, realize that this is possible. And then that why gets stronger and more possible and it, it builds on itself. So you have to get past that. There's this, there's this curve, there's this, this arc of, you know, where you have to get over where you see this, there's this possibility and you can it's hope, change. isn't it? It's hope. It's hopefulness and belief that you can. Yes. Yes. And so that's what choose you now is. And I feel like I've seen it so many times. Like I, you know, from medical school and I know from graduate school that we are taught that when someone has a condition, this is for life. And you, the goal, the role of the healthcare provider is to mitigate the progression of the disease, to, to reduce the risk of having to increase dosage of medicine. That's what I was taught. But for 18 years now, 18 years, thousands of people from my audiences and then hundreds and hundreds that I've worked with one-on-one, -on -one, I've witnessed people heal, get off the medications, reverse diagnoses that they were not supposed to reverse, have energy that they never thought they could have, have inflammation and pain go away, things they never thought possible. I was taught was not possible. It is absolutely possible. And I always say results are typical. It's extraordinary what you can do with food. Yeah. And, and not only just food, isn't it? Because you're talking about so many other things and mindfulness and, and sort of knowing and learning who you are and, and accepting the sort of the goods and bads and the weaknesses and the strong strengths is also so much a part of uh, the process of healing and, and another component of the healing process more also. And sometimes I'd argue more important than eating the food. I like to say exactly. I like to say that food is my, the language I use to deal with life. I look at life through food because that's what I do as a dietitian, but food is the language I speak, but that's what happens. So I always say, I didn't try to like put myself out of business by writing everything I do in my books because that's all great, but it's those amazing conversations I have with clients where you learn about why you make those decisions and how you make those decisions. And what does it really mean underneath? Like I know I get triggered when someone makes a comment about my food, because when I was on one of those diets, when I was an actress as a little girl, and I was eating these six rice cakes a day that I allotted myself when I was on my, you know, my chicken and veggie diet, 
And my mom, one time I was eating my rice cakes that I looked forward to all day. And my mom looked at me because she wanted to help me. She felt bad for me because I always was on a diet for my acting. And she literally put her hand out to take my rice cakes away. <laughs> I was like, and it was like, oh my God. So even to this day, when someone says, oh, well, that's a lot of bell peppers you're eating. I'm like, oh, like, excuse me, don't tell me about my diet. You know, it's amazing. These things that are so deep seated. That was when I was like 17 years old, you know? It's amazing how these things come up and you don't even realize it. So the awareness of those things and why we make those decisions and how to navigate it, it's amazing. It's, it's like, and, and once you know and have that wisdom about yourself, you can't unknow. That's forever, you yeah. know, and it's, it's really so exciting. Special. Yeah. So sad what we do to ourselves and to people um, by saying, you know, you got to, you know, you got to eat this or eat less, eat less, but we don't arm them with the right foods. And we, you know, and so people walk around, I remember I'd, I, I'd walk around, uh, with these really small meals in front of everybody. And then I go sneak a ho-ho that was sitting in the, in the cabinet, um, because I was hungry and I thought, well, I've done so well all day. I'm going to eat that ho-ho, but I would eat it in private. So nobody could make me feel bad that I was too big and fat as, as it were. And so, uh, you know, and I, and no disrespect to my mom or to whoever said it to me, it's, it's, I think it's just, I think that sometimes people say things off the cuff and they don't really mean it, but I think that some, you have to go through the process of digging those things up and, um, understanding that those things are not, uh, they, they, they don't define you and that you're so much more than what other people may have said about you. And those sensitivities, as you pointed out, they're, um, they're, they're not important and they, you can let them go. And you just have to remember that our goals are to listen to our bodies, be, feel healthy all of the time, uh, and eat as many plants as we can. <laughs> Yes. Yes. And again, back to what we were saying before, it's like, I'm not, I was never naturally lean like that, if you will. Like I like to eat, I love food. Obviously I made my whole life surrounding food. And so I've been fascinated by the people that are just naturally lean and they don't ever think about it. Like I've always been fascinated. And then I married a guy like that and my best friend. So I watch my ex-husband. I, I still love to watch him eat like to this day, like 29 years later, I love to watch him eat at my best friend because they are, so I've taken those, I know it's all anecdote, but I've watched this and I've kind of studied this my entire life. So I've taken what they do and I've made them into systems. That's what Choose You Now Diet is about. That's what I do with my clients is here is what they do. And it's a system. It's not, cause it's not natural for me. Like, you know, like, so I watched like recently, actually my ex was like, oh yeah, I ate a lot for blah, blah, blah. So I'm not eating lunch right now or something. I'm like, oh my God, that's so interesting. Like when they eat too much for a couple of days, they rein it in all of these things. So I've turned them into like systems of how we can pretend we are like that because it's not an innate thing. I don't think you, I don't know if you could change into that. Um, but the people I work with and myself included, it's just, I have to think about, it and I have to say no to things that I really want to eat. Um, even if it's healthy, but it's just too much because yeah. it's just not innate for me. Yes. Yes. I, I think that those are such good points. So, you know, Juliana, it's so nice to chat with you. I, I'd like to, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I want to round out a couple of thoughts um, because you've said so many really, I, you know, I, I wrote down actually chronic overnourishment, by the way, because I thought that was an interesting comment. I like to write down comments that people say, and I thought about visceral uh, a lot, that visceral reactions. So I wrote that down as well. But what if you, um, so people always want to know, and I get this question a lot. So I always am curious what people, what you'll learn to answer. Um, people will often ask me, well, what are the five things I should incorporate into my diet? And I'm like, well, gosh, you know, like that's, there's no five things and you want, we want diversity of plant foods and we want to eat, you know, and so, and it's, it should be tailored to different people, to different things. But if somebody forced you to answer, you know, the three or five things that you think should be part of every good, healthy diet, what would you say? I'm just curious. I am uber prepared for this answer because I've been publishing this for in the last several books. I've been okay. writing this for probably since, um, I don't know, three or four or five books. I've published this thing called the six daily threes. Okay. I love it. So instead of the, I have the pyramid and plate out there, but I love the six daily threes because these are when you're like, well, what am I supposed to eat? Well, within the whole food system of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices in infinite tasty combinations, 
there are six food groups that are the most health promoting nutrient dense foods that you should have. And if you want to look, and if anyone wants to look, you can go to plantbaseddietitian.com and look up six daily threes. Cause it's also on my website. So if you could link oh, to right. that or share that this is, you could always look at all the details on this here. Perfect. They are leaf. And it's, and it's, I've changed it a little bit over the years. This is the most up-to-date version. And I, I don't feel like I should have a drum roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Drum roll. One leafy green and cruciferous vegetables okay. every Love day, it. six, at least three servings a day, other colored vegetables, the reds, the oranges and yellows, because those proffer all sorts of like carotenoids and all this other wonderful health promoting nutrition that are unique. These are all things that are unique nutritionally, because you're going to notice what's missing. Everyone does fruits get eat the rainbow every day, all the different types of fruits. And within these categories, you have a lot of variety options. Um, Okay. And then nuts and seeds, one to two ounces a day, 30 to 40 grams a day. There's so much research on the cardiometabolic benefits, the weight management benefits. There's where you get your essential fats, nuts and seeds. Awesome. They look at the L-arginine and then uh, vitamin E, wonderful, wonderful, unique foods. And then fifth is legumes. So all the beans, lentils, peas, soy foods, like tofu and tempeh and hummus should be a food group. That's another group. And oh, the last the one in our family, by the way, <laughs> right? The best food ever. Oh. Um, and then the sixth one was physical ac activity movement every day. But I put that to the side because it's not technically a food. And I realized the magnificence of mushrooms. Mm, vitamin so D. mushrooms have their own category because they have all these immune enhancing properties. I even take mu mushroom capsules lately and they're just amazing. And I, I interviewed Paul Stamets, who's the... Um, the mushroom guy, he's published so much data on mushrooms and their benefits. And he recommended, so I recommend three different species a week to aim for. I try to get three species a day because they're just, I love mushrooms too. A lot of people don't love them, but you can get them in a capsule. You can get them in a tea. You don't even taste them. They're wonderful. So those are the six ones that I recommend. Do you notice what's the, the obvious one that's missing that always, everyone always calls me out on? I'll let you tell me. Whole grains. And the reason they're not on there, there's nothing wrong with whole grains. I'm not anti-grain at all. That's such a myth out there too. They're wonderfully health promoting foods. They are culinarily diverse. Like they make meals substantial and delicious and fabulous. They're not, there's nothing in whole grains that are nutritionally unique. So you don't need to prioritize them. So if you're trying to lose weight, I'd rather you prioritize the six daily threes and then, and then add that afterwards, or if you're don't, if you're not trying to lose weight, then incorporate them, but they're not nutritionally unique. So that's my answer to that. I like, I like it. I, I like that. I liked the whole thing. And I liked your, and I bet people to, will take notes after hearing that, which I think is uh, a great. And I love that you have nuts and seeds on there because I'm a, I love to, uh, and a huge believer in nuts and seeds. And uh, I have a little bit of a cashew addiction myself, um, but I try to eat walnuts and almonds uh, as well. But I, for some reason, I can't get over my cashew addiction. So <laughs> same, I'm in the same category. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. What I do, You're, here's my little hack is I always make dressings and sauces out of cashew, like a cashew base, because it's still creamy. But so what good. I've been doing is I'll add a couple of Brazil nuts, some almonds, just to like get it in there. But the most of it is cashews. That's a good idea. Maybe I'll start doing that because I, I do have a, like, I literally carry around bags of cashews uh, because, um, you know, I, I lately I've been having trouble keeping my weight up rather than down. And so I find that having the cashews there just reminds me to eat and, and because I'm addicted to them. So, <laughs> so that's good. So tell us a little bit before we close about what, uh, how people get a hold of you. How do you do, you know, what do you find is the best and most optimal way to work with people? And tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Monica. Yes. You can find me at plantbaseddietitian.com. I'm across all the social media channels, but I prefer when someone reaches out via my website, because a lot of those messages on social media get lost. And if you don't hear from me, it's because I didn't see the message. I really try to answer everyone's questions. And, um, I do the one-on-one -on -one coaching is I only take a few clients at a time and they have to really want it. So when people reach out, I, they have to really know that they're going to make a transformation. They have to be in a place in their life where they're ready to do it because I will love them all the way through, but I get invested and I want you to win and I want you to succeed. And I want you to literally change your perspective on your body, on diet, on your health, everything, and on food. So, um, I I'm honored to get to really connect with people in that way when I do. 
but um, yeah, I, I also, if anyone has a, just a regular question, I love answering questions on social media as well. I find social media a really great outlet for answering questions in a, in a great way, just a really accessible way. Yay. Yay. So I love that. I love what you're doing. Um, and I, and I do think that we need more people out there that are promoting positive information and who are doing sort of this one-on-one -on -one experience. And so uh, a lot of people tell me that it's expensive and they don't want to spend money. And I always remind them that if we can spend money on uh, a hamburger and hot dog, or we can spend money on a trip, we should be able to also spend money on our health and investing that time into our health because, and I also find that sometimes the bigger the investment, the more I'm into it. Um, and so um, sometimes that's another way to kind of look at it. But uh, I think the uh, investment is absolutely worth it because you are not trying to change, a, do a diet for a few days or, or for a few weeks. You're trying to change a lifestyle and that takes time and it takes effort and it takes uh, tears and blood, sweat and tears, you know? And so it's, um, it's okay. You know, you just have to kind of lean into it, know that that's going to happen, but also be willing to invest that time and, and energy and, and the finances and that's okay. So thank you for bringing up what you do. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And I'll certainly be sending more patients your way because I do think that I certainly need more people to send patients to, to kind of say, well, look, you know, work with this person because they'll be able to give you sort of a step-by-step. -step. And sometimes I, I'm unable to give that kind of time. Uh, and so I appreciate that you have that availability. So thank you for that. Thank you for choose you now. Thank you for chronic overnourishment and visceral reactions and your uh, six, six, uh, six threes. How did you call it? The six daily threes. Six daily threes. And I like the six daily threes. So thank you for all of those things. Um, we'll have your information in the in the links in the bio. And so make sure to look out for uh, Miss Hever, uh, Juliana Hever. She's always doing really fun things. And I always like your great photos on Instagram. So that's always fun. And so thank you for so much for spending time with us and giving people hope and knowing that um, that you can change. And so I appreciate everything that you do. Thank you so much, Monica. You're amazing. I appreciate what you're doing. And I really am honored to be here today. Thank you. Thanks.